thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending. So uh, it's my pleasure to be with you today. And uh, I just would like to start uh, this workshop with a, a, a personal remark. Um, the French is supposed to be the official language of the EPU. English is a working language. So for your pleasure at all, I will switch to French. Geneviève, pas de souci. Je pense que vous n'en aurez pas besoin. Geneviève, don't worry. I don't think you'll be needing your headset. Except maybe for one of our speakers. So as I said, thank you very much uh, for being with us this afternoon. We wanted to organize this session as a workshop in workshop format. And in order to do so, I'll come back to the underlying topic of uh, this conference, which is achieving a single postal territory, a global promise, past and present. And with us today, we have three eminent speakers, some who join us uh, remotely, others who are here in the room. This is the case of Joram, thank you. But they're experts in the way we can together uh, consider the underlying topics of the postal sector. With no further ado, I'll turn to Yves Drollet from the Académie Québécoise d'études philatéliques. And my question to you, Yves, is first of all, whether you can hear us. Yves, can you hear us? It seems to be uh, today's uh, keyword or today's motto. We cannot hear you. Can you try to speak, please? Yeah, no, we have no sound. It's going to be complicated. Okay. Um, maybe we... Maya, can you hear us? Yes, but it's not very loud. Okay, that's a good, that's a good start because we can hear you. Okay, good. So if, if you don't mind, uh, Eve, with my deepest apologies, but just while we are trying to fix the technical problem with the sound, maybe we switch uh, the intervention and we start with Maya. Uh, Maya, si vous êtes d'accord, on, on commence ensemble. Not a problem. You, Maya? But also, if you agree. As you wish. In English or in French. Well, I made oh. my presentation in English, so I have to ah, translate it into French très, très On peut mettre Euh, donc Maria, euh, je me tourne vers vous. So Maria, I'll turn towards you. You have worked for our organization. You have uh, amassed a wealth of uh, experience uh, in the world of uh, uh, stamps and uh, philatelics. Maria, can you tell us a little more about how important it is to keep their identity through postage stamps? And uh, tell us a little more about uh, what they do so as to avoid uh, contradicting systems when it comes to issuing postage stamps. So you have about uh, 15 minutes, no more, if you agree. Okay. So what I'll do is that I'll share my screen with you. Le son est bas, donc je, je vous invite à utiliser. I... Oui, the sound is very low. So I invite all participants to put on their headsets, uh, even if they're listening to the floor. Ok, je suis en train de partager. Ok, I'm trying to share my screen with you. Um, 
voilà. Est-ce que vous voyez There you go. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it perfectly well. Go ahead, Maria. Okay, thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having me participate together with you at this most notable UPU Historians Colloquium under the title of Achieving a Single Postal Territory, a Global Promise Past and Present. Um, that's probably to go back. I went too quickly ahead. <laughs> um, okay, well, the, um, the issue at hand um, with um, honoring the 150 years of the UPU um, uh, is the importance of safeguarding the added value of the postage stamp. It has such a long history, almost 200 years ago, but we have seen over the past probably more than 30 years how the postage stamp has been um, under attack from various areas and, and where we so we have this we are required to do what we can to safeguard it for the future safeguard its added value they just very brief some very brief um, background uh, aspects here that we have seen the postage stamp since 1840 like we said almost 200 years ago as an integral part of the continued history of the UPU. It has, been, it has played and continues to play a crucial role as a facilitator of communications and developing the postal services within the world's most extensive distribution network. It has been and continues to connect the lives and economies of tens of millions of citizens of multiple professions and ages around the world and around a multi-billion dollar our postage stamp industry indicates its importance. Um, going for the, right. So, to further stress the need to safeguard added value, this postage stamp is not just a short-lived, simple piece of gum paper that people are looking, are considering. It is also an investment, a rare collector's item. The most expensive stamp on record is the British Guyana, one cent magenta from 1874. See, like that was sold in 2014 for 9.48 million dollars. And of course, there are many other stamps that have been sold for several million dollars as well. So, notably, as the most visible miniature roving ambassador, that is how the postage stamp has been considered, promoting its 192 UPU members to the farthest corners of the earth, highlighting their culture, emblems, identity building, sovereignty, tourism, all aspects of national identity. UNESCO, for example, has one thousand, over 1,000 heritage sites, many of which are on postage stamps. Here are examples of how postage stamps are highlighted and how they um, add value to the history of the country through stamp collections like this one from the Smithsonian, Smithsonian National Postal Museum in the United States, where stamps are built into exhibitions, beautiful exhibitions, that highlight history and open the eyes and doors open the windows and doors of people to the rest of the world. Another kind of exhibition, for example, is like this one in the Singapore Philatelic Museum that is seeking to reignite, like what we're saying, the good old days of writing, drawing, decorating a metal piece to family, relatives, or friends. And the issue of letter writing is also an aspect of revitalizing the use of the postage stamp. And as we know, the UPU uh, organizes a yearly letter writing competition that also is, in, that is done in, a, in a probably in cooperation with schools, educational authorities, and it was also a UNESCO project. So as part of um, safeguarding the added value is recognizing the philatelic stakeholders. It is vital to recognize and pay tribute to the key role that the postage stamp continues to play 
at the heart of an extensive stamp industry and network that is active in every UPO member. Numerous added value business, cultural, economic, historical, postal, social, tourist, among other activities, revolve around the postal stamp. Museums, philatelists, philatelic libraries, postal historians and writers, postal services themselves, stamp auction houses, stamp artists, collectors and designers, stamp exhibitions and trade fairs, stamp security printers. So many people and so many businesses activities around the world revolve around the post stamp. Their combined turnover amounting to billions of dollars. People are actually are saying today that posted stamps are becoming obsolete because of their diminishing use on physical postal mail against the increased use of electronic communications and the growing popularity of digital and electronic stamps. Since the creation of the UPU in 1874, the growing popularity of stamp collecting and related philatelic activities led to formal organized structures, the AJP for the philatelic press, ASCAT for philatelic publications and stamp catalogs, FIP for philatelists and stamp collectors, IVSDA for stamp agents and sellers, and Intergraph covering postage stamp security printers. Together with the Post, they founded in 1997 the World Association for the Development of Philately, known as the WADP, a postal sector group that functions under the umbrella of the UPU through the POC, Postal Operations Council. The overall aim is to ensure a lasting and dynamic development of philately promoting best practices, good governance, and the protection of, of intellectual property, among other considerations. Cooperation and memoranda. Oh, wait. Go back. Cooperation and memoranda of understanding have been or are underway with more partners, such as educational authorities, UNESCO, Public for Letter Writing, Interpol for stamp security and revenue protection, museums, stamp auction houses, sports organizations, FIFA and IOC, in the International Olympic Committee, the tourism sector, the United Nations itself, and other UN specialized agencies. So if posted stamps are indeed becoming obsolete, we would not be witnessing continuous stamp industry abuses that have already been generating considerable revenues for the private sector for more than 30 years, probably even more. Revenues from the sale of illegal products, in our case illegal stamps, are viewed as a source of money laundering, damaging the integrity of the authentic posted stamp sovereignty of the country's concern. Illegal stamps sold are commonly dispatched using the express and registered products of the postal services. This is an area that the posts need to look at, look into. To make matters worse, we find terms post, postage, post, post, written also ES like this, reproduced on illegal stamps as well as foul cancellation dies. An example will be below. Organizations are also affected through identity theft misappropriation and pirating of the copyright and intellectual property of their brand names and logos, such as for Europa, the Olympics, and the UPU itself, as we will see below. There are, so there are thousands of illegal stamps produced as bogus, fantasy, local, private issues, you name it. On favorite topics such as cartoons, cinema, famous persons, fauna, flora, space, sports, transport, etc. Whatever can be collected is also reproduced on postage stamps, on illegal postage stamps. The worst illegal stamps that we call are reproduced, unfortunately, denigrating and immoral scenes, war personalities, and violence, all in the names of and to the detriment of mostly developing countries, their identity and sovereignty, and of course, damage to the environment when you consider the thousands of pieces of illegal stamps produced, for example. 
It is particularly important to note that many illegal stamps denounced since 1997, when um, the first DPU circular started to come out, over 25 years ago, they continue to be sold and at high prices. There have been numerous new productions every year since. In November 2023, 2023, one site listed 4,994 sets of illegal stamps covering the years 2023 back to 2016 and even earlier. The same site on the 30th of January 2024, a couple days ago, advertised 6,099 items in between. Many items were sold, so there are probably much more than 6,099 items. Another site lists 5,227 similar sets of illegal stamps. Still another site lists similar sets for, for topics. For topics, it was difficult. They do not have an overall figure, total figure. We had to go, we had to go and see per topics, but there was one topic, for example, for sports. 500 or 538 sets for sports. The highest price being an album for 315 euros. There was um, there were 403 sets for war, including two albums each at 316 euros. Another set was of 25 sheets for 73 euros. You can see the high prices of the sales of the illegal stamps that go into the pockets of private sector. The legal stamp situation is extremely serious. For 2023 alone, over 40 UPU member countries have been affected. We're probably more, but we have not been able to identify all of them. Also because many um, illegal stamps are not listed with the country name. They're listed under topics. A great deal of research has to go into identifying the countries involved. An internet site referred to earlier still has 697 sets listed at 30 January 2024 for the year 2023. Several of the most expensive ones are below, and it is important to see how these are um, described. For example, stamps Martin Luther Reform on 2023, year six sheets perforated, go for $99.99. The name of the country on the stamps is Republic de Guinea 2023. It's a set of six sheetlets of eight stamps each. That means 48 illegal stamps in this set. Stamps, Franklin Roosevelt, a similar kind of presentation for Republic de Guinea, also a set of six sheetlets of eight stamps each going for $97.99. Another set for Cabo Verde of six sheetlets of eight stamps each going for $97.20. Another set in the name of Cameroon, Republique du Cameroon, set of six sheet list of eight stamps. And then you also have, for example, like a stamps of prehistoric fauna mammoths. It is indicated they are in the name of the Solomon Islands, but on the sheet list itself, it indicates Sao Tome e Principe 2023. There several examples of such illegal stamps as follow that you have to see to realize how how damaging the situation is against the postage stamps. They are actually only the tip of the iceberg of what is sold on the international market on various internet sites. Here we have a mixture of illegal stamps. There is the illegal use, of course, of the Olympic logo. Unfortunately for the Olympics in Paris 2024, there are already hundreds of illegal stamps. There are sheet lists like the one to the left here, where you have three countries produced in the same sheet list. Here you have Nigeria, Guatemala, and Zimbabwe. You have a country's name that is misspelled, unfortunately, for the Republique de Côte d'Ivoire. It often has illegal stamps that misspell its name. Here it is République instead of République. For example, another a uh, misspelling of Côte d'Ivoire that we have seen was Côte d'Ivoire instead of d'Ivoire. Ivoire. It has a G, Côte d'Ivoire. There is Republique. There is the illegal use of Poste, for example, in this one here, in the name of Gabon. They use the expression Poste, and they also use, and I, there's also the illegal use of the cancellation 
like you can see here, Libreville, 2501-2023, and it is a false cancellation, um, misleading collectors to think that it was indeed produced and canceled by the uh, relevant postal authority. Here we have a counterfeit and illegal reproductions of IROPA 2000 stamps in the name of 16 African different African countries. This is not just like an illegal production, but counterfeit because the symbol, the image itself of Europa is an official symbol used by the official um, European uh, post-Europe country at the time. And this was discovered not in 2000, probably, but uh, later, but they are still on the market. Here we have, unfortunately, UPU itself in various reproductions that has been found on Arico stamps. And we hope, of course, that the International Bureau of the UPU will take action against this as an organization that is leading the cause in the um, fight for against illegal stamps, safeguarding the reputation of the postal stamps. So, and you can see we have, unfortunately, have Capo Verde, Republic du Cameroon, you have uh, Congo, RD Congo, Republic Gabonese, even the names of the countries are probably not official. We also have Union de Comora. This is very serious when they attack even the UPU. This is an example of many such um, sales of boxes and boxes of huge productions of wholesale selling of illegal stamps. It has been shown and uh, it's been around for several years. We have shown it in various fora. And unfortunately, they still persist these kinds of sales. This one indicates, I, we're not sure if it's the whole set of boxes or maybe series that were sold for 1990, 19 US dollars 99, indicating there are more than 10 available and there were 63 sold of this. We don't know if it's a box per set, but nevertheless, you can see the huge productions and this is where the issue of the protection the environment also comes in. With these illegal productions, you have a danger to the environment where the use of the gum, the Kaziaro gum, and the paper, it's a whole underground economy. You can, can, you can imagine that works on producing illegal stamps to this extent. Here is another example of how certain... Merci, uh, Maria. Maria, je vous, me vous me permettrez de vous, de vous couper. Je suis désolé. Maria, thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I overshot the time that was uh, given to me. A very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, uh, certainly many actions can be undertaken. On behalf of the UPU, unfortunately, we're running out of time and we would like to listen to other speakers. So thank you very much, uh, Maria, for this uh, uh, very interesting presentation. The uh, An overview of the current state of uh, uh, philately, uh, official philately and uh, parallel philately. Before giving the floor to other speakers, uh, what is the situation uh, with respect to Yves, Yves Drolet? Can he hear us? Eve, can you hear us? I'm afraid we can't hear you, even though you might be able to hear us. Can you uh, modify your audio settings, Eve? and check your microphone. So let us continue to improvise. Maybe you could disconnect and reconnect to Eve in the meantime. We're going to listen to Yorim Spolder. Or another presentation. Uh, 
pour avoir votre, votre regard d'historien. So, as a historian, Yorim, how has the world of philately evolved over the last 150 years? To English, I, I don't speak French. Um, first and foremost, I hope you can all hear me. I think so, right? Um, yeah, it's a honor to be here, a great pleasure, um, and I hope you bear with me uh, because in this presentation, I will try to explore how stamps can shed light on major moments and trends in global history that is modern uh, global history, and that is admittedly a rather pretentious exercise for 15 minutes, but I will give it my best. Um, I see the slides already up, that's great. Um, so, on a very basic level, stamps illustrate the global victory of the nation-state template. These highly mobile propaganda posters or miniature memorials, as scholars have called them, shed light on the iconography of nationalism and sovereign states. Stamps have been mobilized as political and pedagogical tools that help define, stage, legitimize and advertise the nation's cultural heritage and the state's uh, political ideology and system. However, as I will try to show in this necessarily incomplete and impressionistic overview, stamps also offer an incredibly rich visual archive for historians interested in the aesthetic repertoires of colonialism, anti-colonialism, internationalism, and a vast range of global movements and processes. To mention just a few examples, uh, the global circulation of stamps contributed to the creation of a pantheon of iconic global personalities. Um, the rise of a global cultural heritage paradigm, the promotion of international values and bolstered regional integration schemes. One could say that stamps played a prominent role in the formation and diffusion of a new visual language of the global. That is the main argument I will try to make through many different examples. So in the next uh, few minutes, I will focus primarily on the symbolic uh, content on stamps rather than collecting practices, uh, which offers another very uh, promis uh, promising avenue of research. Now, the first theme, as the slide already hints at, is colonialism. As other panels have pointed out during this conference, the formation of European empires relied on long distance communication and was a major trigger for the introduction of stamps in the 19th century. But other than its function, we can also learn a lot by focusing on the symbolic content of colonial stamps. Stamps issued for use in various European colonies reveal strikingly similar visual strategies. These little artifacts often tapped into the visual language of the colonial picturesque and Orientalism, depicting exoticized native inhabitants, local culture, ancient monuments, scenic landscapes and the primary products uh, in the colony. They evidently cater to the Western gaze and showcase the European vision of Asia, Africa, or the Pacific for that matter. Now, on another level, colonial stamps shaped through circulation new understandings of a colony's past and cultural heritage. The recovery of this past was often informed by archaeological discoveries and a classical bias which prioritized Asian civilizations and monumental architecture. For example, as we can see on this slide, in French Indochina, the newly excavated site of Angkor Wat featured prominently on colonial stamps. This emphasis, as we can see here, endured in the post-colonial age when Angkor became a crucial site in the Khmer nationalist imagination. So this example doesn't show rupture, it shows continuity from the colonial to the post-colonial age. On a completely different level, Stamps issued by European imperial powers often featured colonial themes that familiarized citizens with key events and personalities associated with the foundation of colonies. These stamps were popular collectibles and spread an awareness of overseas possessions not only in the colonial era, but also much later when former colonies had long transformed into independent nation states. For example, here we see uh, commemoratives issued by Spain in the 1960s and 80s, depicting colonial settlements and a series of pioneering conquistadores and navigators. Uh, on the right, you might spot uh, Americo Vespuccio, who lent his name to the American continent. On a completely different level, stamps also shed light on emerging uh, currents of internationalism, universalism and regionalism sweeping the globe in the 20th century. For example, stamps, uh, stamps captured global processes ranging from the transport revolution in the era of aviation, so airplanes, to women's emancipation and scouting. 
For example, as you can see on this slide, almost every country issued stamps to commemorate the World Scout Jamboree, uh, organized almost every four years since 1920. We could also think of stamps promoting universalist ideologies and movements. Think of Rotary, the UN Charter, human rights, and of course, international organizations uh, such as the Red Cross, UNESCO, and ILO. This gave rise to a visual language of globalism. Many of these abstract symbols became iconic. The globe for universal themes, the dove representing peace, the scales of justice, and of course, the Red Cross. Here we see stamps featuring Rotary Internationals, uh, International, uh, with the wheel symbolizing uh, progress through action and service. Another example is the fast range of stamps with the UNESCO theme. These provide startling evidence for the global reach of a new cultural heritage paradigm, transforming cultural, historical, and natural sites across the globe into world heritage. And given the occasion of this conference, let's also have a quick look at the selection of stamps issued to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the UPU in 1949. The 480 issues or so that appeared featured a few common themes, and in fact, many can be seen downstairs in the exhibition. So some issues, as we can see here, featured the handsome Greek god Hermes, who symbolized connection and travel. Some portrayed the Universal Post Monument, erected in Bern in 1909. Many other issues combined the globe, dwarfs and world maps to illustrate the reach of global postal services um, and a commitment to international cooperation. And others focused on uh, the logistics of postal services and depicts modes of transport such as airplanes, trains and steamships. Curiously, some issues evoke as late as 1949 the colonial picturesque and imperial connectivity as these stamps uh, issued by uh, France and uh, Belgian Congo uh, show. And finally, there were, of course, some unique designs informed by creative vision. Uh, the stamps uh, issued by Vatican City, which you can see on the right uh, bottom corner, um, offered, for example, a remarkable blend of global and religious symbolism. Another example are stamps issued to commemorate global sports events. Now, to mind come the long tradition to issue stamps on the occasion of the Soccer World Cup or Olympic Games. But we can also think of commemoratives issued on the occasion of international exhibitions, such as the World Fair organized in New York in 1964. As we can see here, these stamps typically depicted the national pavilions designed by countries for the fair. Stamps also left a visual trail for which we can explore the iconography of emerging global political ideologies such as fascism and communism. For example, stamps issued during the Cold War by countries within the Soviet sphere often contain statements of solidarity and reveal a strikingly similar socialist iconography focusing on industrial workers, factories, peasants and images evoking socialist utopias and revolutions. But stamps also offer a window on the formation of alternative political alliances. The emergence of regional blocs and alliances was often anticipated in stamps. The most notable example is the long tradition, uh, dating back to the 1950s, of joint issues uh, with the Europa or SEPT theme. Another example is the left-wing South-South internationalism inaugurated by the Bandung Conference on Asian-African Cooperation in 1955 and the emergence of the non-aligned movement. Um, and these issues commemorated often conferences and featured uh, the driving forces behind the movement, such as uh, the Indian Prime Minister Nehru, who can be seen here on stamps issued by India, Iraq and Cyprus. Stamps also shed light on the emergence of a pantheon of global iconic personalities throughout the 20th century. Some figures were depicted on stamps across the globe. These included pioneering scientists, for example, Robert Koch, Marie Curie, Copernicus, the founder of the Scout uh, movement, Baden Powell, um, historical figures such as Columbus, and political leaders of global stature, think of Churchill, Gandhi, and of course, Lenin. Lenin's face did not only proliferate on stamps issued by countries within the Soviet sphere, as we can see to the left, but also featured on uh, stamps from India, Sri Lanka, and Syria, uh, as we can see on the right. Another example are cultural icons, which um, bear another common subject, ranging from composers such as Mozart and Beethoven to, um, as we can see here, the Bengali 
poet and humanist, so I mean dramatist, Tagore, who appeared from stamps issued by countries from pretty much every continent on the globe. Finally, stamps can also shed light on the diffusion and politics of aesthetics. A shift in the aesthetics of stamp design often reflected the arrival of a new political ideology or even system. For example, following the foundation of the Turkish Republic, the arabesques and flowery calligraphy of Ottoman stamps were replaced by a westernized and one could say secular aesthetic. But the reverse could also be observed. The secular aesthetic and royal ornamentalism of Persia stamps issued under the Pahlavi dynasty gave way to a highly religiously uh, themed iconography after the Iranian revolution of 1979. But stamp design could also reflect newly emerging aesthetic regimes, as I call them, that were not directly an expression of a clear political ideology. For example, the early 20th century witnessed stamp designs inspired by the cinema's curves and ornamental nature motives inspired by Art Nouveau. Some of these were designed by leading artists of the movement. For instance, Alphonse Mucha created some of the first stamps issued by his native Czechoslovakia. And you can see one of these examples in the right lower corner. Another example is Art Deco. Starting in the interwar period, a variety of European and South American countries issued stems with an Art Deco design. These stems were characterized by the use of bold colors, geometric motifs, sharp outlines and modernist themes uh, focusing on architecture, airplanes and machinery. Now, by way of a conclusion, I would argue that stamps continue to be an interesting visual barometer of global politics, values, and events. From the Chinese project to revive the land and maritime silk roads to global environmentalism and the collective traumatic experience of the COVID-19 pandemic. As the different panels have shown during this conference, the UPU emerged as an ambassador of globalism in the age of nation states. Although stamps are primarily issued by individual countries, the tens of thousands of little artifacts together offer a fast visual archives for historians that review connections as well as ruptures, the rise and fall of political systems, the emergence of a global cultural heritage paradigm and the formation of regional blocks and new trends in arts and design. In short, STEMS represent a multitude of tiny windows that illuminate the fragmented landscape of a collective global past. And I end here. Thank you so much for listening and back to Benjamin. Merci beaucoup, Yori. C'est une vision très intéressante, effectivement, de, de, de tout cet aspect. Alors, le, sou, le suspense est insoutenable. Vous demandez tous si on a retrouvé Yves. Yves, est-ce que vous nous entendez Oui, on ne vous entend toujours pas. Alors, que fait-on What shall we do, Yves We still can't hear you. Uh, yeah, it's on this side. Um, maybe, if pouvez vous débrancher votre casque? Eve, could you unplug your headset and use the microphone in your computer? Use your computer microphone. Why don't you take the headset out completely, unplug it completely? Can you hear me now? Unfortunately, the sound quality, if it continues this way, will not be sufficient for the interpreters to interpret. There's a quite a loud echo. We heard you for a moment, Eve. Could you say something? How about this? Okay, don't touch anything now. It seems to be working. Go ahead. No, don't touch anything else. It, it seems to be working now. Nope. He touched something.
obviously. Could you say something, Eve, please, so we can tell if we can hear you or not? He's not, he's not talking, so we can't hear him. Could you please say something, Eve? Dites quelque chose. Could you speak into your microphone, Eve? <laughs> can, can you speak to us, please? L speak, speak loud. He's not muted in our system. Is he? No, that was. We heard him once. Okay. That, that means, yeah. It's something. Yeah. It's really like strange. Yeah. Okay, well, let's try one last time. Eve, a few moments ago, we heard you briefly. Could we ask you to say something into your microphone, anything you like? Um, unplug your headset, plug it back in. Can you hear me now? We, we can hear you. Don't move. Don't move. Ah, really? It's working? Excellent. Turn up the volume. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, really? We often say things weren't so bad in the past, but Eve, uh, according to my understanding, you have a very interesting globalized approach to the single postal territory from its very inception. Eve, we've been waiting uh, with bated breath and we're going to be delighted to listen to you. Let me share my screen, says Eve. Share your screen. Just a minute where we, we lost the video, but we've got the sound. Eve, why don't you let us uh, share your presentation from here and you can start your present, you can start speaking. Excellent. We'll share this, we'll share the presentation and we'll leave the speaking to you. Firstly, I'd like to thank Professor Leonard Labori, who invited me to speak about the topic, philatelists, witnesses, and actors in the first globalization. Could we have the next slide? And you can go straight to the next one. In 2006, a historian, we should uh, study philately during colonial ex uh, expansion called the first globalization from the beginning of the 19th century to the first world war. The world uh, achieved a degree of unification that it wouldn't see again until the 1990s. This was characterized by the intertwining of economies and societies driven by 
the advent of the Global Postal Union and the foundation of the Universal Postal Union in 1874. Postal stamps were symbols of civilization uh, for societies. Uh, the exploration of to these topics by uh, we think we think it's uh, a good way into this topic. Most of the first philatelists were middle class. The interpreter apologizes. The sound quality is very bad, and the speaker is reading a text. Uh, this was the case for stamp dealers, like Jean-Baptiste Mons from Belgium and Arthur Maury from France. The, these first editors wanted to insist on the importance of stamps for discovering the world. These stamps were some time were founded on the principles of progress and an occidental, a Western perspective. The 1860s were a period of optimism and uh, technological breakthroughs in 1863. The uh, steam, steam navigation made it possible for trade to develop a pace in the same way. A publicist, a friend of Amaury, said that the stamp was a sign of civilization. Charles Viner said that stamps denoted progress in civilization. As Marie said, the postal stamp is civilization. For stamp editors, the, there was emancipation in Europe and Uh, however, the Western origins of the civilization progress didn't take on board the idea and the Af Asian and African stamps came ground in Asia, for example. The first stamps in Arabic were celebrated by Weiner. As a sign of the Ottoman Empire's wanting to open up to the world. The philatelic editors were less optimistic about Africa. Marie felt that The, those who wish to solve the problem of quality or equality or inequality could not look to stamps. Conversely, Maury and Heiner saw in this Liberian stamp the wish to move towards civilization and away from slavery. Moens led a charge against segregation in the United States, saying that Afro-Americans would always be subjugated. Viner claimed that the expulsion of Afro-Americans had uh, the interpreter ap apologizes once again. The sound quality is too poor for proper interpretation. Moens 
said that people in Oceania are closer to orangutans than men. But they said this was a matter of circumstance rather than intrinsic inferiority. Mullins and his colleagues took the example of the independent kingdom of Hawaii, where they said that missionaries had quickly turned these bloodthirsty natives into civilized human beings. In the eyes of philatelic editors, uh, we see here the stamp of Kamehameha, the great, the founder of the kingdom. Mori compared Kamehameha to Peter the Great who had westernized Russia. And then we have President Rivadavia, a, a well-known figure in Argentina. For Mori, the expansion of Western civilization was the culmination of the Enlightenment and, uh, and had brought light to the world. Mori thought that each French colony should have its own stamps as the populations were integrated into Western culture. For others in the same period, no nation should miss the train of progress. Mori came back to the idea that French colonies should have their own stamps, but so the interpreter apologizes. The sound quality is really not uh, sufficient for interpretation. Paradoxically, he was a staunch defender of Ethiopia's independence against Italian aggression and played a leading role in the issue of the first Ethiopian stamps in 1994, resolving the apparent contradiction by claiming that Ethiopians were white. Mori's defense of Ethiopia stemmed from the fact that the country was a French ally in the scramble for the Horn of Africa, while Italy was backed by Britain. The Franco-British colonial rivalry that culminated in the Fashoda incident soured the, soured the hitherto good relations between these two nations, and Mori, who had always voiced admiration for British and American stamps, expressed growing exasperation at Anglo-Saxon expansionism, especially at the occasion of the Boer War. Which was... Uh, One adulator of the British Empire was Frederick William Wordler, a Canadian accountant and stamp dealer who edited the Montreal Philatelis from 1999 to 1902. Like the other philatelic thinkers of this time, Wordler saw postage stamps as one of the main factors and symbols of humankind's progress. In his eyes, this eminent dignity of postage stamps extended to their collecting. And philatelic rose above a hobby because stamp collectors acquired a moral sense and an open-mindedness which made them fit to participate in the advancement of humanity by embracing the universe into their fold. In his mind, however, these humanist beliefs coexisted with a deep attachment for the British Empire, 
The two were particularly difficult to, con to reconcile at a time when the Boer War had sparked a bout of aggressive patriotic frenzy in the British world. Dealing in his own way with these contradictions, Wurlu sought to achieve a synthesis between universalism and imperialism. He drew a parallel between the expansion of British hegemony and the advent of cheap postage and insisted that the empire owed its legitimacy and greatness to the propagation of the same progressive humanistic ideals that made philately valuable. The same ambiguous imperialism is found in the texts contributed to the material philatelist by Vivian Gosset from New Zealand, who provides an insight into the complex attitude of colonists toward native people. In a series of articles on the history of stamps on the Cook Islands, Vivian describes the inhabitants as lazy, easygoing people and uh, made fun uh, of the postmasters, uh, saying that they occasionally ran around with a bag of mail for a week before it struck them that uh, they had letters to deliver. To deliver. In the same vein, the Cook Islands sovereign Makea Tokau, depicted on stamps since 1993, was paid the double-edged compliment of being a very intelligent, common-sense woman for a Maori. On the other hand, the early Maori were lauded as a stalwart race, and the residents of one of the islands were praised for having taken the opportunity of annexation to abolish their aristocracy aristocratic social structure in favor of a European-style equality of rights between the former chiefs and slaves, in line with the idea that colonization involved a worldwide extension of Western democracy. Wordless uh, Journal sought to be the school and hub of a virtual global community of philatelic humanists who would play their role as witnesses and agents of globalization by spearheading the, transcend the transcending of geographical, linguistic, and cultural barriers albeit under the benevolent aegis of the white Anglo-Saxon men who saw themselves at the forefront of civilization progress as inventors of the postage stamp. I hope that this short presentation has highlighted the usefulness of philatelic literature as a source for historians. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Yves, pour, uh, pour votre intervention. Thank you very much, Yves, uh, for your contribution. And once again, my apologies to you all here in the room and online since we had uh, technical issues and therefore had to switch uh, the order of speakers, which had been scheduled. Now, are there any questions in the room or online, Mr. Bush? Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, je souhaiterais Good afternoon to you all. I'd like uh, to come back uh, to Ms. Libera's uh, presentation, who was the first. First of all, I'd like to thank you uh, because you're giving me further arguments. And then thank you very much, uh, Mr. Combe. You've opened the door of the UPU to someone like me, who's uh, a philatelic negotiator, so I'm not used to being here. The observation you make in your first presentation is uh, something that we see in all documents of UPU Congresses for the past uh, decades or so. And I'm wondering about uh, the solution, potential solutions to these issues. You mentioned uh, the World Association for the Development of Philatelic, and this is more uh, comment than a question. This association, uh, a few years back, I, I've been working in uh, the world of uh, philately for uh, 10, 15 years now. It's an association that exists, but uh, it's not open to the grassroots uh, for to people like me, at least not open up until recently. So I think uh, there could be uh, improvements made at this uh, level. You spoke about illegal stamps, and uh, this is something I'd like to come back to. I'm uh, my area of specialization is uh, African stamps. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, illegal stamps uh, in this particular uh, area. I could talk about it forever, but I think uh, we could give assistance to countries who are harmed by the issuance of such stamps so that they can become sovereign again. They can regain sovereignty over the issuance of uh, stamps. Some agencies issue 
legal steps that are very costly, but they're both the problem and the solution. We've got a profitability issue in terms of uh, sources of income for these countries, but I do think that they're part of the solution. If they're part and parcel of the solution, if uh, they had uh, a central role, it would uh, avoid further problems down the line. I'll keep it there because otherwise I could speak forever on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Bush. I understand that it's more by ways of a comment than a question, but I'm turning to Ms. Libera to see whether you would like to answer this comment very briefly since we're running out of time. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks uh, for giving me the floor after this contribution. You've uh, referred to the World Association for the Development of Philately. It's uh, the body in that could help uh, to in the fight against uh, illegal stamps. Now, I don't know how things stand. I don't uh, know what their work plan is, whether it's, but I guess they could uh, uh, take up this issue. And with regard to African countries, uh, I recently participated in a colloquium on uh, African countries uh, in November 2023, and the issue that is still pending is the following. Yes, uh, African countries would like us uh, to support them in implementing best practices in the issuance of uh, stamps. There are many possibilities in this respect. Personally, I continue to help them and advise them but uh, we need to have uh, concerted action and look into this uh, together with the regional organizations to look at uh, best practices, philatelic best practices uh, to avoid them falling victim of this phenomenon, which is far from being over. We need to prioritize this. Uh, it's a matter of uh, income. It's a matter of reputation of these countries. Uh, philatelists no longer want to collect stamps from these countries because uh, they don't know whether these stamps are legal or illegal. And uh, in there, there's a whole program that could be developed in this regard. This uh, could be done by uh, the International Bureau to help uh, these countries uh, together uh, with the World Association. But I'm quite positive if I think we can do something, but the decisions uh, need to be made. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. And before I move on to the next question, the forum that you mentioned, I was there too. I was representing uh, the UPU. It was organized in Rabat uh, for all African countries. I think 37 countries were there in Rabat. Uh, great work was done by our Moroccan colleagues and following this impetus, uh, discussions uh, have started with many African countries to look at best practices and a continuous improvement of their philately. Mr. Salvatore, you had a question? Yes, I do have a question. The previous speaker already uh, took the words out of my mouth. Uh, France and uh, Europe uh, is being flooded uh, by illegal stamps uh, that are manufactured in China. It is the case in France, it is the case in Great Britain. So I was wondering what the UPU could do in this regard. Obviously, administrations uh, should uh, press charges, uh, go see law enforcement or Interpol, but these uh, stamps are being printed in China. I was wondering whether the UPU could maybe pressure or put pressure on the government, uh, on governments from these countries so that this uh, practice ceases. 
Uh, I'll comment on this. Uh, the UPU is uh, dealing with this issue, which is uh, of uh, critical importance uh, for a number of years. The UPU's policy was to try and identify the source of these illegal stamps. It's uh, not a single country, it's a whole area that is concerned. Uh, the UPU will take responsibility. We've uh, started working on technical means and uh, simply information to try and fi fight again uh, counterfeited stamps. Uh, I'm intentionally trying to be remain vague because we're working on this uh, and I do hope that in the near future we will come up with uh, further needs uh, to provide our designated operators so uh, with means to fight against this phenomenon. Thank you very much Mr. Chairman. I work as a curator of the collection of the Museum of Communication in Bern, and we have quite a big stamp collection, so that's why I'm here. And I have a question for you. I really like your research, and you talked a lot about like things are the same on a global scale on stamps. Did you also find like massive differences between countries? Could you say something about that? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. That's a very interesting question. Um, I mean, the, the very format of stamps lends itself to a certain kind of standardization. And what I find interesting is that there is a certain language of the global being developed in abstract symbols or icons or even in personalities. And it's always difficult to then sort of attribute a politics or meaning to it. So, for example, why does Lenin appear on a stamp issued by India? It's not a communist country. I mean, it is not surprising that Lenin appears on a stamp, let's say, issued by Poland or Hungary during the Cold War. But maybe in India, Lenin was an anti-imperialist figure. So that was attributed to him there. Um, so yeah, there must be many, many differences, um, probably also between regions. But I, I wouldn't have a clear sort of answer to that in terms of a conceptual sort of demarcation or differentiation. Um, yeah. Yes, I would love to. Yeah. Thank you. Oui, Madame Tevos au fond. Ms. Tevos, at the back of the room. Uh, unfortunately, I missed the, sorry, at the beginning of your presentation, I was in the uh, other hall. I found it very interesting what you said about um, cultural heritage, art design, art nouveau. Uh, Mucha from the Czech Republic, well, Czechoslovakia, I suppose, at the time. Um, being somewhat of an artist myself, uh, I'm wondering, as far as aesthetics go, like now in 2024, the trends seem to be monochrome on one hand, but very vibrant colors on the other hand. Um, what do you foresee as far as aesthetics for stamps in the next few years? We. <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, I mean, the question is first and foremost, I guess, whether in this, uh, what is it, post, post, post modern world, there can be even somehow a shared visual language in terms of aesthetics, as we might have seen it in the time of Art Deco or Art Nouveau. Um, a little bit, anything goes right to a certain extent. Um, yeah, so so I, I don't know exactly where, where this would move, but it's a very interesting question that I never thought about before. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. Maybe we can talk later too. Sorry? <laughs> Maybe we can talk later too. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Mademoiselle, vous aviez une question également? I will do it very quickly. Um, in Within the Soviet Union, we can see resistance movement using fake stems or legal stems, as they are called here, um, as a way to finance their movements. Um, so in a way, they are great historical source, as you said, because you can see these Europa stems being um, redone. Have you seen that anywhere else stems being used as a resistance um, yeah, financial fund in a way? Was that a question for me or for Maria? Actually? Alors, je, je, voilà. Les, I, I did not understand very well. Maria, qui a fait un tel uh, 
exposé impressionnant sur les timbres illégaux et leur usage, ou peut-être plutôt pour Yorin Can you repeat the question for Maria? Maria, can you relax very briefly to this question and then I'll give the floor to Yorin. Could the question be repeated? I haven't quite understood it. The question, if uh, I haven't misunderstood, correct me if I'm wrong. The question is that uh, there are a certain number of uh, entities uh, who decide uh, to issue stamps, legal stamps, to fund their movements. Is that your question? Well, I think we need to look at uh, the groups who could fund their movements. We, to, in order to determine this, we have to look at the illegal stamps that are being issued. There are a certain number of illegal stamps that uh, are in circulation in Ukraine, for instance, they're illegal because uh, uh, they're post-Maidan and not Ukraine. And they're on topics such as uh, violence, war. So I think we would have to have a global picture and we would have to see who are the authorities who could fight against this. So we'd have to, without seeing these stamps, it's kind of hard to give an opinion on this and who's behind. Uh, of course, we know that uh, the international mafia uses illegal stamps to fund uh, its illegal activities, but I think we'd have to look into this uh, much more in depth to know exactly what's going on. Thank you very much, Maria. Yorin? response that goes in a different direction, uh, but in terms of sort of stamps and resistance, right, that was a question that you asked. How, how can one be radical on stamps? It's a very conservative um, medium, I would say, in many ways, because it's linked to the nation state. But I think on a global plane, you can definitely see that stamps are being used for all sorts of politics that are also um, anti-colonial, are, are radical in that sense. They challenge a vision of world order by the West or capitalism or whatever it is. I mean, anti-colonialism definitely is a theme on stamps. And the, all this uh, solidarity is being built in that way by countries issuing the stamps using s uh, similar symbols. Um, yeah, that's a very superficial answer, but yeah, talk later. <laughs> Je vous remercie à moi une dernière. Allez, une dernière. Thank you very much. Maybe one last question. We could stay here forever, but there are other sessions. Society. So postage stamps, some beautiful ones we saw on the screen here, that can be, it's typically the gateway drug into philately as a hobby for people. And, and yet uh, stamps typically go on envelopes and the envelope um, uh, mailing rates in, in most Western countries are, are going down quite dramatically. Swiss Post just uh, announced last week, last year's uh, letter volume. 10 year decline, five years, 5% 5 down year on year for 10 years. You can do the math in about 15 years. There'll be no letters left, right? And therefore no stamps. What, and yet that's the way most people get into philately as a hobby. So, so here's my question. The UPU's 250th anniversary, 100 years from now, you may be still there, but say, say your, your, your grandkids are there. What are you going to say about the last 100 years of flatly the history of that hundred years of flatly hundred years from now of the coming hundred years what are those people at, at the 250th uh <clears throat> sicoli i'm going to say about this coming hundred years of flatly when there are no stamps to have ever created that base so the question is or or the panel. Oh, the, the entire panel. The, the assembled okay. uh, brains. Uh, Eve, yes. what would be your best guess? Well, I, I would say that everything that has a beginning has an end. So 
stamps appeared in 1840. I guess there may not be stamps left uh, 100 years from now, but uh, stamps are increasingly becoming a subject of academic uh, research since the 1980s. So I guess maybe uh, maybe this is kind of the future of stamps. Uh, apart from the fact that the really rare stamps will, will probably remain as, uh, yes. as uh, collectibles. Maria, une, une vision sur ces 100 prochaines années uh, Sur les légal, prochaines années Légal. Pardon On the next 100 years, a, a legal vision, not illegal. Well, postage stamps are the symbols of the nation state, the identity of the state. Uh, they are reflected in the UPU regulations. Uh, they can continue to exist as uh, the symbol of a nation, but uh, we need uh, to control the way they are manufactured. If you enable parallel markets uh, to continue acting in this way, well, of course, uh, this will wreak havoc uh, in the traditional uh, stamp community. Uh, there are many more illegal stamps in developing countries than authentic stamps. Uh, so what will be left for the future generations, so those who are interested in collecting stamps? Uh, the stamps uh, remain uh, the symbol and the identity of uh, the nation state. This is something that is very important. This is something that has to be preserved, and we need uh, to maintain uh, a minimum, at least, uh, of production of postage uh, stamps. Uh, uh, this is a very difficult problem, and we'll have to find uh, solutions uh, to overcome this difficulty. Yoram, a very last reaction. It's a very big question. Um, it can go in different. It can go different ways, right? On the the, the, the postage stamp can go the way of, of uh, videos, like no one buys videos anymore. But on the other hand, you have all these objects that are no longer per se functional because they are anachronistic and therefore surpass. But they become collectibles because they have an aura. There is something artsy about them. And stamps are often quite artful. There's a lot of uh, artistic work that goes into designing them. Uh, they're pretty objects. I think most people agree. Um, the question is probably, uh, will stamps still be used in schools uh, by teachers? Is there a shared sort of hobby among children? Um, you could even argue that now there's a good time to start because it's cheaper than ever. You can go to the, the flea market in uh, Berlin where I used to live and on Sundays you can buy uh, for 10 euros, uh, you can buy yourself uh, a whole collection. Yeah. <laughs> Alors, je, je vais juste donner le mot de la fin puisque la session suivante commence à l'étage supérieur et je vous invite... The next sûr. session is about to begin. But simply to react to your question, I would say the following. I'm an optimist rather than a pessimist. Philately, over the last 200 years, has always succeeded in reinventing itself. Uh, look at uh, the associations of uh, dealers and uh, uh, stamp collectors, and even though the volumes of uh, mail using stamps will drop, well, of course, uh, the stamps uh, will continue to exist. Uh, the passion of philatelists uh, will remain. And I do believe uh, that uh, even in 100 years from now, stamps will still exist, uh, even though they may not be used uh, for mail purposes. Thank you. Thank you very much.